This is the autobiography of Malcolm X, chapter 18, which is entitled El Hajj Malik El Shabazz. Prince Basil, the absolute ruler of Arabia, had made me a guest of the state. Among the courtesies and privileges which this brought to me, especially shamelessly, I relished the chauffeured car which toured me around in Mecca with the chauffeur guide pointing out sites of particular significance. Some of the holy city looked as ancient as time itself. Other parts of it resembled a modern Miami suburb. I cannot describe with what feelings I actually pressed my hands against the earth where the great prophets had tried 4,000 years before. The Muslim from America excited everywhere the most intense curiosity and interest. I was mistaken time and again for Cassius Clay. A local newspaper had printed a photograph of Cassius and me together at the United Nations. Through my chauffeur guide interpreter, I was asked scores of questions about Cassius. Even children knew of him and loved him there in the Muslim world. By popular demand, the cinemas throughout Africa and Asia had showed his fight. At that moment in young Cassius's career, he had captured the imagination and support of the entire dark world. My car took me to participate in special prayers at Mount Arafat and at Mina. The roads offered the wildest drives that I had ever known. Nightmare traffic, brakes squealing, skidding cars, and horns blowing. I believe that all of the driving in the Holy Land is done in the name of Allah. I had begun to learn the prayers in Arabic now. My biggest prayer difficulty was physical. The unaccustomed prayer posture had caused my big toe to swell, and it pained me. But the Muslim world's customs no longer seemed strange to me. My hands now readily plucked up food from a common dish shared with brother Muslims. I was drinking without hesitation from the same glass as others. I was washing from the same little pitcher of water and sleeping with eight or ten others on the mat in the open. I remember one night at Muzdalifa with nothing but the sky over her overhead, I lay awake amid sleeping Muslim brothers and I learned that pilgrims from every land, every color and class and rank, high officials and the beggar alike, all snored in the same language. I bet that in the parts of the Holy Land that I visited, a million bottles of soft drinks were consumed and 10 million cigarettes must have been smoked. Particularly the Arab Muslims smoked constantly even on the Hajj pilgrimage itself, the smoking evil was invented in Prophet Muhammad's days. If it had been, excuse me, the smoking evil wasn't invented in Prophet Muhammad's days. If it had been, I believe he would have banned it. It was the largest Hajj in history, I was later told. Kasim Gulek of the Turkish parliament beaming with pride, informed me that from Turkey alone, over 600 buses, over 50,000 Muslims had made the pilgrimage. I told them that I had dreamed to see the day when shiploads and plane loads of American Muslims would come to Mecca for the Hajj. There was a color pattern in the huge crowds. Once I happened to notice this, I closely observed it thereafter. Being from America made me intensely sensitive to matters of color. I saw that people who looked alike drew together and most of the time stayed together. This was entirely voluntary, there being no other reason for it. The Africans were with Africans, Pakistanis were with Pakistanis, and so on. I tucked it into my mind that when I returned home, I would tell Americans this observation that where true brotherhood existed among all colors, where one, where no one felt segregated, where there was no superiority complex, no inferiority complex, then voluntarily, naturally, people of the same kind felt drawn together by that which they had in common. 
It is my intention that by the time of my next Taj pilgrimage, I will have at least a working vocabulary of Arabic. In my ignorant, crippled condition in the Holy Land, I have been lucky to have met patient friends who enabled me to talk by interpreting for me. Never before in my life had I felt so deaf and dumb as during times when no interpreter was with me to tell me what was being said around me or about me or even to me by other Muslims before they learned that the Muslim from America knew only a few prayers in Arabic and beyond that, he could only nod and smile. Behind my nods and smiles though, I was doing some American type thinking and reflection. I saw that Islam's conversions around the world could double and triple if the colorfulness and the true spiritualness of the Hajj pilgrimage were properly advertised and communicated to the outside world. I properly advertised the community. I saw that the Arabs are poor in understanding the psychology of non-Arabs and the importance of public relations. The Arabs said, Inshallah, God willing. Then they waited for converts. Even by this means, Islam was on the march. But I knew that would improve public relations methods, the number of new converts turning to Allah could be turned into millions. Constantly, wherever I went, I was asked questions about America's racial discrimination, even with my background. I was astonished at the degree to which the major single image of America seemed to be discrimination. In a hundred different conversations in the Holy Land with Muslims high and low and from around the world and later, when I got back to Black Africa, I don't have to tell you never once that I bite my tongue or miss a single opportunity to tell the truth about the crimes, the evils, and the indignities that are suffered by the Black man in America. Through my interpreter, I lost no opportunity to advertise the American black man's real plight. I preached it on the mountain at Arafat. I preached it in the busy lobby of the India of the Jeddah Palace Hotel. I would point at one after another to bring it closer to home. You, 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 because of your dark skin in America, you too would be called Negro. You could be bombed and shot and cattle prodded and fire holes and beaten because of your complexion. <clears throat> At some of the poorest pilgrims heard me preach, so did some of the holy world's most important personages. I talked at length with the blue-eyed, blonde-haired Hussein Amini, Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. We were introduced on Mount Arafat by Kasim Gulik of the Turkish parliament. Both were learned men. Both were especially well read on America. Kasim Gulik asked me why I had broken with Elijah Muhammad. I said that I preferred not to elaborate upon our differences in the interest of preserving the American black man's unity. They both understood and accepted that. I talked with the mayor of Mecca, Sheikh Abdullah Irif, who would, when he was a journalist, had criticized the methods of the Mecca municipality. And Prince Faisal made him the mayor to see if he could do any better. Everyone generally acknowledged that Sheikh Iraif was doing fine. A film feature, The Muslim from America, was made by Ahmed Horiala and his partner, Esid Mohammed of Tunis, television station. In America once, in Chicago, Ahmed Horiala had interviewed Elijah Muhammad. The history of the Jeddah Palace Hotel offered me frequent, sizable, informal audiences of important men from di many different countries who were curious to hear the American Muslim. I met many Africans who had either spent some time in America or had heard other Africans' testimony about America's treatment of the black man. I remember how before one large audience, one cabinet minister from Black Africa, he knew more about worldwide current events than anyone I've ever met, told of his occasionally traveling in the United States, North and South. Deliberately, 
not wearing his national dress. Just recalling the indignities he had met as a black man seemed to expose some raw nerve in this highly educated, dignified official. His eyes blazed in his passionate anger. His hands hacked the air. Why is, Ameri why is the American black man so complacent about being trampled upon? Why doesn't the American black man fight to be a human being? If Sudanese high official hug me, you champion the American black people. As Indian official, an Indian official wept in his compassion for my brothers in your land. I reflected many, many times to myself upon how the American Negro has been entirely brainwashed from ever seeing or thinking of himself as he should, <clears throat> as a part of the non-white peoples of the world. The American Negro has no conception of the hundreds of millions of other non-whites concerned for him. He has no conception of their feeling of brotherhood for and with him. It was there in the Holy Land and later in Africa that I formed the conviction which I have ever since that a topmost requisite for any Negro leader in America ought to be extensive traveling in the non-white lands on this earth. And the travel should include many conferences with ranking men of those lands. I guarantee that an honest, open-minded Negro leader would return home with more effective thinking about alternative avenues to solutions of the American black man's problem. Above all, the Negro leaders would find that many non-white officials of the highest standing, especially Africans, would tell them privately <clears throat> that they would be glad to throw their weight behind the Negro cause in the United Nations and in other ways. But these officials understandably feel that the Negro in America is too confused and divided that he doesn't himself know what his cause is. Again, it was mainly Africans who variously expressed to me that no one would wish to be embarrassed by trying to help a brother who shows no evidence that he wants that help and who seems to refuse to cooperate in his own interest. The American black leader's most critical problem is lack of imagination. His thinking, his strategies, if any, are always limited, at least basically, to only that which is either advised or approved by the white man. And the first thing the American power structure doesn't want any Negro to start is thinking internationally. I think the single mo worst mistake of the American black organizations and their leaders is that they have failed to establish direct brotherhood lines of communication between the independent nations of Africa and the American black people. Why every day the black African heads of state should be receiving direct accounts of the latest developments in the American black man's struggles. Instead of the US State Department's releases to Africans, which always imply that American black man's struggle is being solved. Two American authors, bestsellers in the Holy Land, had helped to spread and intensify the concerns for the American black man. James Baldwin's books, translated, had made a tremendous impact, as had the book Black Like Me by John Griffin. If you're unfamiliar with that book, it tells how the white man Griffin blackened his skin and spent two months traveling as a Negro about America. When Griffin wrote, of the experiences that he met, a frightening experience. I heard exclaimed many times by people in the holy world who had read the popular book, but I never heard it without opening their thinking further. Well, if it was a frightening experience for him, 
as nothing but a make-believe Negro for 60 days. Then you think about what real Negroes in America have gone through for 400 years. One honor that came to me, I had prayed for his eminence. Prince Faisal invited me to a personal audience with him. As I entered the room, the tall, handsome Prince Faisal came from behind his desk. I never will forget the reflection I had at that instant, that here was one of the world's most important men, and yet, with his dignity, one saw clearly his sincere humility. He indicated for me a chair opposite from his. Our interpreter was the deputy chief of protocol, Muhammad Abdul Aziz Majed, an Egyptian-born Arab who looked like a Harlem Negro. Prince Faisal impatiently jested when I began stumbling for words, trying to express my gratitude for the great honor he had paid me in making me a guest of the state. It was only Muslim hospitality to another Muslim, he explained and I was an unusual Muslim from America. He asked me to understand above all that whatever he had done had been his pleasure with no other motives whatsoever. A gliding servant served a choice of two kinds of tea as Prince Faisal talked. His son, Muhammad Faisal, had met me on American television while attending a North, Northern California university. Prince Faisal had read Egyptian writers' articles about the American black Muslims. If what these writers say is true, the black Muslims have the wrong Islam, he said. I explained my role of the previous 12 years of helping to organize and to build the nation of Islam. I said that my purpose for making the Hajj was to get an understanding of true Islam. That is good, Prince Faisal said pointing out that there was an abundance of English translation literature about Islam so that there was no excuse for ignorance and no reason for sincere people to allow themselves to be misled. The last of April, 1964, I flew to Beirut, the seaport capital of Lebanon. A part of me I left behind in the holy city of Mecca, and in turn, I took away with me forever a part of Mecca. I was on my way now to Nigeria from Ghana, but some friends I had made in the Holy Land had urged instead that I make some steps in route, and I had agreed. For example, it had been arranged that I would first stop and address the faculty and the students at the American University of Beirut, in Beirut's Palm Beach Hotel. I luxuriated in my first long sleep since I had left America. Then I went walking, fresh from weeks in the Holy Land. Immediately, my attention was struck by the mannerisms and attire of the Lebanese women. In the Holy Land, there had been the very modest, very feminine Arabian women, and there was the sudden contrast of the half French, half Arab Lebanese women who projected in their dress and street manners more liberty, more boldness. I saw clearly the obvious European influence upon the Lebanese culture. It showed me how any country's moral strength or its moral weakness is quickly measurable by the street attire and attire of its women, especially its young women. Whatever the spiritual values have been submerged, if not destroyed, by an emphasis upon the material things, invariably, the women reflected, witness the women, both young and old in America, where scarcely any moral values are left. There seems in most countries to be either one extreme or the other. Truly, a paradise could exist wherever material progress and spiritual values could be properly balanced. I spoke at the University of Beirut, the truth of the American black man's condition. I previously made the comment that any experienced public speaker can feel his audience reactions. As I spoke, 
I thought the subjective and defensive reactions of the American white students present, but gradually their hostilities lessened as I continued to present the unassailable facts. But the students of African heritage, well, I'll never get over how the African displays his emotion. Later, with astonishment, I heard that the American press carried stories that my Beirut speech caused a riot. What kind of a riot? I don't know how any reporter in good conscience could have cabled that across the ocean. The Beirut Daily Star front page report of my speech mentioned no riot because there was none. When I was done, the African students all but besieged me for autographs. Some of them even hugged me. Never have even American Negro audiences accepted me as I have been accepted time and again by the less inhibited, more down-to-earth Africans. From Beirut, I flew back to Cairo, and there I took a train to Alexandria, Egypt. I kept my camera busy during each brief stopover. Finally, I was on a plane to Nigeria. During the six hour flight, when I was not talking with the pilot who had been a 1960 Olympic swimmer, I sat with a passionately political African. He almost shouted in his fervor, when people are in a stagnant state and are being brought out and being brought out of it, there is no time for voting. The central theme was that no new African nation trying to decolonize itself needed any political system that would permit division and bickering. The people don't know what the vote means. It is the job of the enlightened leaders to raise the people's intellect. In Lagos, I was greeted by Professor Essien Udon of the Ibadan University. We were both happy to see each other. He had met me in the United States as he had researched the Nation of Islam for his book, Black Nationalism. At his home that evening, a dinner was held in my honor, attended by other professors and professional people. As we ate, a young doctor asked me if I knew that New York City's press was highly upset about a recent killing in Harlem of a white woman, for which, according to the press, Many were blaming me, at least indirectly. An elderly white couple who owned a Harlem clothing store had been attacked by several young Negroes, and the wife was stabbed to death. Some of these young Negroes, apprehended by the police, had described themselves as belonging to an organization called Blood Brothers. These youths allegedly had said or implied that they were affiliated with Black Muslims who had split away from the nation of Islam to join up with me. I told the dinner's guests that it was my first word of any of it, but that I was not surprised when violence happened in any of American ghettos where black men had been living packed like animals and treated like lepers. I said that the charge against me was typical white man scapegoat seeking, that whenever something white, whenever something white men disliked happened in the black community, it's typically white public attention was directed, not at the cause, but at a selected scapegoat. As for the blood brothers, I said I considered all Negroes to be my blood brothers. I said that the white man's efforts to make my name poison actually succeeded in making millions of black people regard me like Joe Lewis. Speaking in the Ibadan University's Trenchard Hall, I urged that Africa's independent nations needed to see the necessity of helping to bring the Afro-Americans case before the United Nations. I said that just as the American Jew is in political, economic, and cultural harmony with world Jewry, I was convinced that it was time for all African, for all Afro-Americans to join the world's Pan-Africanists. I said that physically, we Afro-Americans might remain in America, fighting for our constitutional rights, but that 
philosophically and culturally, we Afro-Americans badly needed to return to Africa and to develop a working unity in the frame of Pan-Africanism. Young Africans ask me politically sharper questions than one's hears from most American adults. Then an astonishing thing happened. When one old West Indian stood and began attacking me for attacking America. Shut up, shut up, students yelled, booing and hissing. The old West Indian tried to press defiance of them. And in a sudden rush, a group of students sprang up and were after him. He barely escaped ahead of them. I never saw anything like it. Screaming at him, they ran him off the campus. Later, I found out that the old West Indian was married to a white woman. And he was trying to get a job in some white influence agency, which had put him up to the challenge. Then I understood his problem. This wasn't the last time I've seen Africans almost fanatic expression of their political emotions. Afterward, in the students' union, I was plied with questions and I was made an honorary member of the Nigerian Muslim Students Society. Right there, right here in my wallet is my card, Al Haji. Malcolm X, registration number M138. With the membership, I was given a new name, Omawali. It means in the, Yoru the, in the Yoruba language, the son who has come home. I meant it when I told them I had never received a more treasured honor. 600 members of the Peace Corps were in Nigeria. I learned some white Peace Corps members who talked with me were openly embarrassed at the guilt of their race in America. Among the 20 Negro corpsmen I talked with, a very impressive fellow to me was Larry Jackson, a Morgan State College graduate from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, who had joined the Peace Corps in 1962. I made Nigerian radio and television program appearances. When I remember seeing black men operating their own communications agency, a thrill still runs up my spine. The reporters who interviewed me included an American Negro from Newsweek magazine. His name was Williams. Traveling through Africa, he had recently interviewed Prime Minister Nkrumah. Talking with me privately, one group of Nigerian officials told me how skillfully the U.S. Information Agency sought to spread among Africans the impression that American Negroes were steadily advancing and that the race problem would soon be solved. One high official told me, our informed leaders and many, many others know otherwise. He said that behind the diplomatic front of every African U.N. official was recognition of the white man's gigantic duplicity and conspiracy to keep the world's peoples of African heritage separate, both physically and ideologically from each other. In your land, how many black people think about it that South and Central and North America contain over 80 million people of African descent? He asked me. The world's course will change the day the African heritage peoples come together as brothers. I never had heard that kind of global black thinking from any black man in America. From Lagos, Nigeria, I flew to Accra, Ghana. I think that nowhere is the black continent's wealth and the natural beauty of its people richer than in Ghana, which is so proudly the very fountainhead of Pan-Africanism. I stepped off the plane into a jarring note. A red-faced American white man recognized me. He had nerve to come up grabbing my hand and telling me in a molasses draw that he was from Alabama. And then he invited me to his home for dinner. My hotel's dining room when I went to breakfast was full of more of those whites. 
discussing Africa's untapped wealth as though the African war African waiters had no ears. It nearly ruined my meal, thinking how in America they sick police dolls on black people and threw bombs in black churches while blocking the doors of their white churches. And now, once again, in the land where their forefathers had stolen blacks and thrown them into slavery was that white man. Right there at my Ghanaian breakfast table, was where I made up my mind that as long as I was in Africa, every time I opened my mouth, I was going to make things hot for that white man, grinning through his teeth, wanting to exploit Africa again. It had been her human wealth the last time. Now he wanted America, now he wanted Africa's mineral wealth. And I knew that my reacting as I did presented no conflict with the convictions of brotherhood which I had gained in the Holy Land. The Muslims of white complexions who had changed my opinions were men who had showed me that they practiced genuine brotherhood. And I knew that any American white man with a genuine brotherhood for a black man was hard to find, no matter how much he grinned. And I knew that my reacting as I did, thank you, the author Julian Mayfield seemed to be the leader of Ghana's little colony of Afro-American expatriates. When I telephoned Mayfield in what seemed no time at all, I was sitting in his home surrounded by about 40 Black American expatriates. They had been waiting for my arrival. There were business and professional people, such as the militant former Brooklynites, Dr. and Mrs. Robert E. Lee, both of them dentists, who had given up their United States citizenship. Such others as Alice Wyndham, Maya Angelou, Mick, Victoria Garvin, Leslie Lacey had even formed the Malcolm X Committee to guide me through a whirlwind calendar of appearances and social events. In my briefcase here are some of the African press stories which had appeared when it was learned that I was en route. Malcolm X's name is almost as familiar to the names as the Southern Dogs, Wire Hoses, Cattle Prods, People Sticks, and the ugly hate controlled white faces. Malcolm X's decision to enter the mainstream of the struggle heralds a hopeful sign on the sickeningly dismal scene of brutalized, nonviolent, passive resistance. An extremely important fact is that Malcolm X is the first Afro-American leader of national standing to make an independent trip to Africa since Dr. Du Bois came to Ghana. This may be the beginning of a new phase in our struggle. Let's make sure we don't give it less thought than the State Department is doubtless giving it right now. Another, Malcolm X is one of our most significant and militant leaders. We are in a battle. Efforts will be made to malign and discredit him. I simply couldn't believe this kind of reception 5,000 miles from America. The officials of the press had even arranged to pay my hotel expenses, and they would hear no objection that I made. They included T.D. Bafol, the editor-in-chief of the Ghanaian Times, G.T. Anin, the managing director of the Ghana News Agency, Kofi Batsa, the editor of Spark and the secretary general of the Pan-African Union of Journalists, and Mr. Cameron Dudo, and others. I can only thank them all. Then, during the beautiful dinner, which had been prepared by Julian Mayfield's pretty Puerto Rican wife, Anna Livia, she was in charge of a cross district health program. I was plied with questions by the eagerly interested black expatriate from America who had returned to Mother Africa. I can only wish that every American black man could have shared my ears, my eyes, and my emotions throughout the round of engagements which had been made for me in Ghana. And my point is saying, 
My point in saying this is not the reception that I personally received as an individual of whom they had heard, but it was the reception tended to me as the symbol of the militant American black man, as I had the honor to be regarded. As jam-packed press club conference, at a jam-packed press club conference, I believe the very first question was why had I split with Elijah Muhammad? I believe that in a nation of Islam, the Africans had heard such rumors as that Elijah Muhammad had built a palace in Arizona. I straightened out that falsehood and I avoided any criticism. I said that our disagreement had been in terms of political direction and involvement in the extra religious struggle for human rights. I said I respected the nation of Islam for its having been a psychologically revitalizing movement and a source of moral and social reform, and that Elijah Muhammad's influence upon the American black man had been basic. I stressed to the assembled press the need for mutual communication and support between the Africans and Afro-Americans whose struggles were interlocked. I remember that in the press conference, I used the word Negro, and I was firmly corrected. The word is not favored here, Mr. Malcolm X. The term Afro-American was greater me- has greater meaning and dignity. I sincerely apologize. I don't think I said Negro again as long as I was in Africa. I said that the 22 million Afro-Americans in the United States could become for Africa a great positive force, while in turn, the African nations could and should exert positive force at diplomatic levels against the Americans, against the Amer- against America's racial discrimination. I said all of Africa unites in opposition to South Africa's apartheid and to the oppression in the Portuguese territory but you waste your time, but you, but you waste your time if you don't realize that Reward and Salazar and Britain and France never could last a day if it were not for the United States support. So until you expose the man in Washington, D.C., you haven't accomplished anything. I know that the State Department's G men in Williams was officially visiting in Africa, I said. Take my word for it. You be suspicious of all these American officials who come to Africa, grinning in your faces when they don't grin in ours back home. I told them that my own father was murdered by whites in the state of Michigan, where G. Men in Williams was once the governor. I was honored at the Ghana Club by more representatives and dignitaries. I was a guest at the house of the late Black American author Richard Wright's daughter, beautiful, slender, soft-voiced Julia, whose young French husband publishes a Ghanaian paper. Later in Paris, I was to meet Richard Wright's widow, Ellen, and a younger daughter, Rachel. I talked with ambassadors at their embassies. The Algerian ambassador impressed me as a man who was dedicated totally to militancy and to world revolution as the way to solve the problems of the world's oppressed masses. His perspective was attuned not just to Algerians, but to include the Afro-Americans and all others anywhere who were oppressed. The Chinese ambassador, Mr. Wang Ha, a most perceptive and also most militant man, focused upon the efforts of the West to divide Africans from the peoples of African heritage elsewhere. The Nigerian ambassador was deeply concerned about the Afro-Americans' plight in America. He had personal knowledge of their suffering, having lived and studied in Washington, D.C. Similarly, 
the most sympathetic Mali ambassador had been in New York at the United Nations. I breakfasted with Dr. Mekonen of British Guiana. We discussed the need for the type of Pan-African unity that would also include the Afro-Americans. And I had a talk in depth about Afro-American problems with Nana Nketia, the Ghanaian Minister of Culture. Once when I was returned to my hotel, a New York City call was waiting for me from Malgood of the American Broadcasting Company. Over the telephone, Malgood asked me questions that I answered for his beeping tape recorder about the Blood Brothers in Harlem, the rifle clubs for Negroes, and other subjects with which I was being kept identified in the American press. In the University of Ghana's Great Hill, Great Hall, I addressed the largest audience that I would in Africa, mostly Africans, but also numerous whites. Before this audience, I tried my best to demolish the false image of American race relations that I knew was spread by the U.S. Information Agency. I tried to impress upon them all the true picture of the Afro-Americans play at the hands of the white man. I worked on these whites there in the audience. I've never seen so many whites so nice to so many blacks as you white people here in Africa. In America, Afro-Americans are struggling for integration. They should come here to Africa and see how you grin at Africans. You're really got, you've really got integration here. But can you tell the Africans that in America, you, you grin at the black people? No, you can't. And you don't honestly like these Africans any better either. But what you do like is the minerals Africa has under her soil. Those whites in the audience turned pink and red. They knew I was telling the truth. I'm not anti-American and I didn't come here to condemn America. I want to make that very clear, I told them. I came here to tell the truth. And if the truth condemns America, then she stands condemned. One evening, I met most of the officials in Ghana, all of those with whom I had previously talked, and more, at a party that was given for me by the Honorable Kofi Bako, the Ghanaian Minister of Defense, and the leader of the National Assembly. I was told that this was the first time such an honor had been accorded to a foreigner since W.B. Du Bois had come to Ghana. There was music, dancing, and fine Ghanaian food. Several persons at the party were laughing among themselves, saying that at an earlier party that day, U.S. Ambassador Mahomey was knocking himself out, being exceptionally friendly and jovial. Some thought that he was making a strong effort to counteract the truth about America that I was telling every chance I got. Then, an invitation came to me, which exceeded my wildest dream. I would never have imagined that I would actually have an opportunity to address the members of the Ghanaian parliament. I made my remarks brief, but I made them strong. How can you condemn Portugal and South Africa while our Black people in America are being bitten by dogs and beaten with clubs. I said I felt certain that the only reason Black Africans, our Black brothers, could be so silent about what happened in America was that they had been misinformed by the American government's propaganda agency. At the end of my talk, I heard, yes, we support the Afro-American morally physically, materially, if necessary. In Ghana or in all Black Africa, my highest single honor was an audience at the castle with Osagiepo, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Before seeing him, I was searched most thoroughly. I respected the type of security the Ghanaians erect around their leader. 
it gave me that much more respect for independent black men. Then as I entered Dr. Nkrumah's long office, he came out from behind his desk at the far end. Dr. Nkrumah wore ordinary dress. His hand was extended and a smile was on his sensitive face. I pumped his hand. We sat on a couch and talked. I knew that he was particularly well-informed on the Afro-American's plight. As for years, he had lived and studied in America. We discussed the unity of Africans and peoples of, Af of African, we discussed the unity of Africans and people of African descent. We agreed that Pan-Africanism was the key also to the problems of the very down to earth qualities of Dr. Nkrumah. My time with him was up all too soon. I promised faithfully that when I returned to the United States, I would relate to Afro-Americans his personal warm regards. That afternoon, 39 miles away in Waniba, I spoke at the Kwame Nkrumah Ideological Institute where 200 students were being trained to carry forward Ghana's intellectual revolution. And here again, occurred one of those astounding demonstrations of the young African political fervor. After I had spoken, during the question and answer period, some young Afro-Americans stood up whom none there seemed to know. I am an American Negro, he announced himself. Vaguely, he defended the American white man. The African students booed and harassed him, then instantly, when the meeting was over, they cornered this fellow with verbal abuse. Are you an agent of Rockefeller? Stop corrupting our children. The fellow had turned out to be a local secondary school teacher placed in a job by an American agency. Come to this institute for some orientation. Temporarily, a teacher rescued the fellow, but then the students rushed him and drove him away, shouting, Stooge, CIA. American agent, Chinese ambassador, Mrs. Wang Hua, gave a state dinner in my honor. The guests included the Cuban and the Algerian ambassadors. And also it was here that I met Mrs. W.E.B. Du Bois. After the excellent dinner, three films were shown. One, a color film depicted the People's Republic of China in celebration of its 14th anniversary. Prominently shown in the film was the militant former North Carolina Afro-American Robert Williams, who has since taken refuge in Cuba after his advocacy that the American black people should take up arms to defend and protect themselves. The second film, focused upon the Chinese people's support for the Afro-American struggle. Chairman Mai Xi Tung was shown delivering his statement of that support, and the film offered sickening moments of graphic white brutality, police and civilians, to Afro-Americans who were demonstrating in various U.S. cities seeking civil rights. And the final film was a dramatic presentation of the Algerian Revolution. The Malcolm X Committee rushed me from the Chinese embassy dinner to where a soiree in my honor had already begun at the press club. It was my first sight of Ghanaians dancing the highlight. A high and merry time was being had by everyone, and I was pressed to make a short speech. I stressed again the need for unity between Africans and Afro Americans. I cried out of my heart, now dance, sing, but as you do, remember Mandela, remember Sobokwe, remember Lumumba in his grave, remember South Africans now in jail. I said, you wonder why I don't dance? Because I want you to remember 22 million African Americans in the United States, but I sure felt like dancing. 
The Ghanaians performed a high life as it possessed. One pretty African girl sang Blue Moon like Sarah Vaughan. Sometimes the band sounded like Milk Jackson, sometimes like Charlie Parker. The next morning, a Saturday, I heard that Cassius Clay and his entourage had arrived. There was a huge reception for him at the airport. I thought that if Cassius and I happened to meet, it would likely prove embarrassing for Cassius since he had elected to remain with Elijah Muhammad's version of Islam. I would not have been embarrassed, but I knew that Cassius would have been forbidden to associate with me. I knew that Cassius knew I had been with him and for him and believed in him when those who later embraced him felt that he had no chance. I decided, I decided to avoid Cassius so as to not put him on the spot. A luncheon was given for me that afternoon by the Nigerian High Commissioner, His, Excellen His Excellency Al Haji Isawali, a short, bespectacled, extremely warm and friendly man who had lived in Washington, D.C. for two years. After lunch, His Excellency spoke to the guests of his American encounters with discrimination and of the friendships he had made with Afro-Americans. And he reaffirmed the bonds between Americans, between Africans and Afro-Americans. His Excellency held up before the luncheon guests a large and handsome issue of an American magazine, Horizon. It was open to an article about the Nation of Islam written by Dr. Moreau Berger of Princeton University. One full page was a photograph of me. The opposite full page was a beautiful color photograph, was a beautiful illustration of a black royal Nigerian Muslim, stalwart and handsome of hundreds of years ago. When I look at these photographs, I know these two people are one, said His Excellency. The only difference is in their attire, and one was born in America and the other in Africa. So to let everyone know that I believe we are brothers, I am going to give El Haji Malcolm X a robe like that worn by the Nigerian in this photo. I was overwhelmed by the gesture. I was overwhelmed by the splendor of the beautiful blue robe and the orange turban which His Excellency had presented to me. I bent over so that he, a short man, could properly arrange the turban on my head. His, Excell His Excellency, Al Haji Isa Wali, also presented me with a two-volume translation of the Holy Quran. After this unforgettable luncheon, Mrs. Shirley Graham Du Bois drove me to her home so that I could see and photograph the home where her famed late husband, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, had spent his last days. Mrs. Du Bois, a writer, was the director of Ghanaian television which was planned for educational purposes. When Dr. Du Bois had come to Ghana, she told me, Dr. Nkrumah had set up the aging great militant Afro-American scholar like a king, giving to Dr. Du Bois everything he could wish for. Mrs. Du Bois told me that when Dr. Du Bois was failing fast, Dr. Nkrumah had visited and the two men had said goodbye, both knowing that one's death was near, and Dr. Nkrumah had gone away in tears. My final Ghanaian social event was a beautiful party in my honor, given by His Excellency, Dr. Armando Entrago Gonzalez, the Cuban ambassador to Ghana. The next morning, it was Sunday, The Malcolm X Committee was waiting at my hotel 
to accompany me to the airport. As we left the hotel, we met Cassius Clay with some of his entourage returning from his morning walk. Cassius momentarily seemed uncertain. Then he spoke, something almost monosyllabic like, how are you? It flashed through my mind how close we had been before the fight that had changed the course of his life. I replied that I was fine, something like that, and that I hoped he was, which I certainly meant. Later on, I sent Cassius a message by wire saying that I hoped that he would realize how much he was loved by Muslims wherever they were and that he would not let anyone use him and maneuver him into saying and doing things to tarnish his image. The Malcolm X Committee and I were exchanging goodbyes at the Accra airport when a small motorcade of five ambassadors arrived to see me off. I no longer had any words. In the plane bound for Monrovia, Liberia, to spend the day, I knew that after what I had experienced in the Holy Land, the second most indelible memory I would carry back to America would be the Africa seething with serious awareness of itself and of Africa's wealth and of her power and of her destined role in the world. From Monrovia, I flew to Dakar, Senegal. The Senegalese in the airport hearing about the Muslim from America stood in line to shake my hand. And I signed many autographs. Our people can't speak Arabic, but we have Islam in our hearts, said one Senegalese. I told them that exactly described their fellow Afro-American Muslims. From Dakar, I flew to Morocco where I spent a day sightseeing. I visited the famous Kaspar, the ghetto which had resulted when the ruling French, when the ruling white French wouldn't let the dark-skinned natives into certain areas of Casablanca. Thousands upon thousands of the subjugated natives were crowded into the ghetto in the same way that Harlem in New York City became America's Kaspar. It was Tuesday, May 19th, 1964, my 39th birthday, when I arrived in Algiers. A lot of water had gone under the bridge in those years. In some ways, I had had more experiences than a dozen men. The taxi driver, while taking me to the hotel, Aledi, described the atrocities the French had committed and personal measures that he had taken to get even. I walked around Algiers, hearing rank and foul expressions of hatred for America, for supporting the oppressors of the Algerians. They were true revolutionaries, not afraid of death. They had for so long faced death. The Pan-African jet, which took me home, it was flight 115 landed at New York's Kennedy Air Terminal on May 21st at 4.25 in the afternoon. We passengers filed off the plane and toward customs. When I saw the crowd of 50 or 60 reporters and photographers, I honestly wondered what celebrity I had been on the plane with. But I was the villain they had come to meet. In Harlem especially, and also in some other U.S. cities. The 1964 long hot summer's predicted explosions had begun. Article after article in the white man's press had cast me as a symbol, if not a causative agent of the revolt and of the violence of the American black man, wherever it has sprang up. In the biggest press conference that I had ever experienced, Anywhere, the camera balls flashed and the reporters fired questions. 
Mr. Malcolm X, what about those blood brothers reportedly affiliated with your organization? Reportedly trained for violence who have killed innocent white people. Mr. Malcolm X, what about your comment that Negroes should form rifle clubs? I answered the questions. I knew I was back in America again, hearing the subjective scapegoat seeking questions of the white man. New York white youth were killing victims. That was a sociological problem. But when black youth killed somebody, the power structure was looking to hang somebody. When black men had been lynched or otherwise murdered in cold blood, it was always said things will get better. When whites had rifles in their homes, the constitution gave them the right to protect their home and themselves. But when black people even spoke of having rifles in their homes, that was ominous. I slipped in on the reporter something he hadn't been expecting. I said that the American black man needed to quit thinking what the white man had taught him, which was that the black man had no alternative except to beg for his so-called civil rights. I said that the American black man needed to recognize that he had a strong airtight case to take to the United States before to take the United States before the United Nations on a formal accusation of denial of human rights. And that if Angola and South Africa were precedent cases, then there would be no reason, there would be no easy way that the US could escape being censured right on its own home ground. Just as I had known, the press wanted to get me off that subject. I was asked about my letter from Mecca. I was all set up with a speech regarding that. I hope that once and for all, my hajj to the holy city of Mecca has established for our Muslim mosque authentic religious affiliation with the 750 million Muslims of the Orthodox Islamic world. And I know once and for all that the black Africans look upon America's 22 million blacks as long lost brothers. They love us. They study our struggle for freedom. They were so happy to hear how we are awakening from our long sleep after so-called Christian white America had taught us to be ashamed of our African brothers in homeland. Yes, I wrote a letter from Mecca. You're asking me, didn't you say that now you accept white men as brothers? Well, my answer is that in the Muslim world, I saw, I felt, and I wrote home how my thinking was broadened. Just as I wrote, I shared true brotherly love with many white complexion Muslims who never gave a single thought to the race or to the complexion of another Muslim. My pilgrimage broadened my scope. It blessed me with a new insight. In two weeks in the Holy Land, I saw what I never had seen in 39 years here in America. I saw all races, all colors, blue-eyed blondes to black-skinned Africans in true brotherhood, in unity, living as one, worshiping as one. No segregationists, no liberals. They would not have known how to interpret the meaning of those words. In the past, yes, I have made sweeping indictments of all white people. I never will be guilty of that again. As I know now that some white people are truly sincere, that some truly are capable of being brotherly toward a black man. The true Islam has shown me that a blanket indictment of all white people is as wrong as when whites make blanket indictments against blacks. Yes, I have been convinced that some American whites do want to help cure the rampant racism which is on the path to destroying this country. It was in the holy world that my attitude was changed. 
of what I experienced there and by what I witnessed there in terms of brotherhood, not just brotherhood towards me, but brotherhood between all men of all nationalities and complexions who were there. And now that I am back in America, my attitude here concerning white people has to be governed by what my black brothers and I experience here and what we witness here in terms of brotherhood. The problem here in America is that we meet such a small minority of individual so-called good or brotherly white people. Here in the United States, notwithstanding those few good white people, it is the collective 150 million white people whom the collective 22 million black people have to deal with. Why here in America, the seeds of racism are so deeply rooted in the white people collectively, their belief that they are superior in some way is so deeply rooted that these things are in the national white subconsciousness. Many whites are even actually unaware of their own racism until they face some test and then their racism emerges in one form or another. Listen, the white man's racism toward the black man here in America is what has got him in such trouble all over this world with other non-white peoples. The white man, the white man can't separate himself from the stigma that he automatically believes about anyone, no matter who, who is not of his color. And the non-white peoples of the world are sick of the condescending white man. That's why you've got all of this trouble in places like Vietnam or right here in the Western Hemisphere. Probably 100 million people of African descent are divided against each other, taught by the white man to hate and to mistrust each other. In the West Indies, Cuba, Brazil, Venezuela, all of South America, Central America, all of those lands are full of people with African blood. On the African continent, even a white man has maneuvered to divide the black African from the brown Arab, to divide the so-called Christian African from the Muslim African. Can you imagine what would happen? What would certainly happen if all of these African heritage peoples ever realized their blood bond? If they ever realize they all have a common goal, if they ever unite. The press was glad to get rid of me that day. I believe that the black brothers whom I had just recently left in Africa would have felt that I did the subject justice. Nearly through the night, my telephone at home kept ringing. My black brothers and sisters around New York and in some other cities were calling to congratulate me on what they had heard on the radio and television news broadcasts. And people, mostly white, were wanting to know if I would speak here or there. The next day, I was in my car, driving along the freeway, when at a red light, another car pulled alongside. A white woman was driving, and on the passenger side next to me was a white man. Malcolm X, he called out. And when I looked, he stuck his hand out of his car across at me, grinning. Do you mind shaking hands with a white man? Imagine that. Just as the traffic light turned green, I told him, I don't mind shaking hands with human beings. Are you one? This has been the reading of the autobiography of Malcolm X, chapter 18, entitled El Hajj Malik El Shabazz. Thank you.